All right, main public, we are one minute out. Dr. Thibodeau, you're ready to go. Great. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Nirav Shah. I'm the director of the State of Maine Center for Disease Control and Prevention. I'm joined this afternoon by Commissioner Pender Macon from the Department of Education and Commissioner Jean Wambrew from the Department of Health and Human Services. We're here today to provide everyone an update on school reopening across the state of Maine. I'd like to turn things over to Commissioner Macon. Good afternoon, everybody. Maine Department of Education has been working with school and district leaders to ensure a safe and healthy return to the in-person instruction this fall. We've been providing professional development, technical assistance, and funding to support the many unanticipated and unbudgeted expenses related to the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. We've been developing Maine-specific online learning platforms and pre-K-12 social emotional learning curriculum that will be accessible to all students, families, and educators in September. And we are delighted to report that we've been awarded a highly competitive grant that will place Maine at the forefront of innovative practice. As just one of 11 states whose applications were approved, we will receive nearly $17 million to provide professional development and innovative design processes for Maine teachers, staff, and school leaders to support the development and piloting of revolutionary new approaches to remote and hybrid learning models. As we prepare for an unprecedented back to school season, we are grateful for the partnerships of the partnership of our colleagues at Maine CDC and DHHS and for the team of public health experts who have created an assessment for measuring the relative risk of COVID-19 transmission in each county. And this has been posted for the first time today on the Maine DOE website. These risk designations are based on quantitative scientific data and qualitative factors, which Dr. Shah and Commissioner Lambrew will speak to shortly. And an update will be provided to us every two weeks using a 14-day rolling assessment to support schools in preparing for and responding to any changes in the trajectory of COVID-19. I want to be clear, these COVID-19 transmission risk designations should not be interpreted as the sole consideration for school districts and superintendents. A green or lower risk designation does not mean that school districts must return to all in classroom instruction. And even in green counties, all of the main CDC requirements for health and safety must be implemented. Each school and school district faces challenges related to facilities, adequate staffing, transportation, and other resources. And so the county risk levels are simply intended to provide district leaders and planning teams with another set of criteria to help inform their decision-making processes and for planning the opening of schools for in-person instruction. We anticipate that many school districts will implement some form of hybrid education plan as we begin this new school year in order to minimize the number of people on buses or in schools or classrooms at any one time. And we will continue to support our schools through financial resources and guidance as they begin to make the difficult work of implementing the health and safety protocols meaningful and workable within every school and every district. 
I'm grateful to know that our state continues to be relatively safe. And I recognize that this is due to the exceptional work and expert judgment of our colleagues at CDC and DHHS. It is also due to the unshakable values that we hold here in Maine, where people look out for one another and place the well being of family and friends and neighbors above self interest. As we approach this new school year in this unprecedented new context of a global pandemic, you can count on our teachers, our staff, and our school leaders to develop plans for providing a world class education for Maine students and to prioritize the continued health and safety of all members of the school community. And Maine DOE will be doing all we can to support them. I'd like to invite Dr. Shaw back to take some questions. Great, thank you very much, Commissioner Macon. And as the commissioner noted, we're gonna turn things over to our colleagues in the media for their questions. And the afternoon's first question goes to Jackie Mundry from News Center. Good afternoon. I just had a quick question. Um, we had a viewer reach out to us that asked about um, spacing between desks and schools if their kids do attend, go back to school. They said something about three feet apart. Is that something that's going to be, you know, enacted? I know we've been talking a lot about six feet apart. Uh, so I'll begin by saying we worked with the Department of Education, the Maine CDC, as well as other public health experts to develop two sets of lists. One is what is minimally required, those must-dos. The other is those, uh, those practices that are recommended because they're good practices. What we did learn in this review is that when you look at uh, what, for example, the American Academy of Pediatrics have recommended, they think with other different, different types of protections, with face coverings, with outdoor activity as much as possible, you can have children three feet apart rather than six feet apart, but those children must stay six feet apart from adults because we imagine that again in classrooms, these different settings, we think with other types of protections, those children can be safe. So that is the minimum recommendation in the set of guidelines. Thanks, Jackie. Uh, we're gonna turn next to Isha at the Bangor Daily News. Hi, Dr. Shaw. Thank you for taking my questions today. Um, my first question is um, maybe uh, just both of them are directed to you. Um, First of all, are there more detailed assessments coming, especially for some schools in um, southern counties where there have been higher COVID-19 case counts? And um, my second question is, um, all 16 counties are marked green so far, despite pretty large differences in um, just the COVID-19 situation. So what is exactly, like, in terms of maybe positivity rate, can you explain what it would have to be for a county to be marked yellow? And sure thing, Isha. So I'll, I'll take your first question. One of the reasons that we chose to provide this analysis, this guidance at the county level, is that we know that school districts do not exist as islands unto themselves. Teachers may travel from other parts of the state, students may be coming in from other parts of the state. So we wanted to provide a high enough level of analysis so that school administrators could have a global view of what's going on not just in the zip code that the school is in, but in the surrounding area. Because if we learned anything during COVID-19, it's that you can't just take a look at what's happening on your street. You've got to take a broader look what's happening all around you. And that's why we provided the analysis at the county level. It's just that, as Commissioner Macon mentioned, it's one piece of guidance that school administrators can use among many as they are making their assessments about how to approach in-classroom education in the fall. Now, you, you noted the questions about how we go about this. Well, it's a mixture of quantitative factors and qualitative factors. Some of the quantitative factors among many that we look at are things like positivity rates, numbers of new cases, as well as reports from clinicians across the state about what kind of symptoms people are coming into their offices with. There's not a strict cutoff for any of these because it's a blend of all of the factors that we take a look at. You're right that there are some, some counties that have rates that are different from others. That's to be expected at any, in, in any large state like ours. But we also have to set those in the context of what's going on nationally. 
So although there is variation within the state, when we compare the counties in Maine relative to what we see in other counties nationally, we see that even the counties where there is more COVID-19 still fare and look better than what we've seen in other places. The qualitative factors that I mentioned are equally important. This is not a pure numerical calculation. So for example, if there were an outbreak in a county that otherwise had low numbers, but that outbreak were focused on a childcare setting or an after-school program where children are likely to be visiting, that might change our analysis as well. So we take all of these things into consideration as we're providing this guidance. And I'll, I'll add just a couple points. One as a reminder is that we do know some of our counties are relatively large. There may be a county that at some point is yellow where there are parts of it that may be able to, maybe may parts of those counties where community transmission is relatively low and those school districts may opt for more children in classrooms and vice versa. There may be green counties where again, this is not green, go back to pre-COVID days, this is green, you can open your schools if you meet those six requirements that are on the Department of Education website, if you have the sufficient space and capacity to do so, there may be school districts in counties that are green that may choose to delay or do hybrid learning. So this is just a set of recommendations. We appreciate that counties are relatively big, but as Dr. Shaw said previously, um, children often come from different parts of the state crossing county lines, teachers often cross county lines. So we appreciate the fact that it's not um, as refined as some would like, but we also think it gives that larger view that is important as our school districts make their decisions. I'm gonna turn next to Robbie Feinberg at Maine Public. Hey there, Dr. Shaw um, and Commissioner Macon, Commissioner Lambrew. Um, my question I think is primarily for Commissioner Macon. Um, I wanna just an update on securing PPE for districts, particularly with all of the you know, counties getting that, that green rating, I imagine we'll probably need more PPE you know, within a month. So what, what is that going to take? What's the role that the, the, the state is playing there in order to secure it? Will we have enough when schools do reopen? Right, thank you so much for that question, Robbie. We, um, we have months ago, in fact, we started working with MEMA and with the state to obtain, procure, make sure we could put our hands on the scarce resources that are out there. And they have all been ordered, paid for at the state level. So this will be offered at no cost to Maine's public schools and to the schools who serve Maine public students. Um, and districts have placed their orders. We sent out order forms. Some of the PPE is already in warehouses in the state. And I believe we are mobilizing a National Guard to assist in the delivery of these um, very important items to all schools. Um, among the things we ordered, include those would include masks and cloth face coverings, some with the clear panels for children who struggle with reading lips or need to uh, observe nonverbal cues or learn phonics. Uh, it also includes face shields, um, hand sanitizing gel, and um, other types of PPE that are gonna be necessary for more close contact situations. M much of it, as I mentioned, is already here in the state and we do expect another delivery sometime in the very end of August, early September. And so we'll be making that available as quickly as we can to all schools. Thanks, Robbie. I'm gonna turn next to Brian Sullivan at WABI. Thank you, and this question is for anyone who feels comfortable answering it. Uh, if all counties are being classified as green, but I think you just said, Dr. Shaw, that uh, if a outbreak was to happen in a county where it was classified as yellow, that school district could then choose if the, it was more centralized to another school, they could choose for in-person learning, even though they're classified as yellow. So why designate them by colors if it's really more on the local school to make these decisions. Yeah, Brian, I'll, I'll start and then and welcome, welcome uh, the commissioners as well. These designations are intended to be guidance to help administrators get a sense epidemiologically of what's going on in their neighborhood. Uh, a lot of the numbers that epidemiologists talk about, um, are, there, there's a lot of them and they can be difficult to have context around. 
So what we wanted to do was to take those various and distinct pieces of data and try to distill them down uh, for non-epidemiologists to get a sense of what's going on in the world around them. Now, I wanna be really clear uh, about one thing. The green designation is important as all, as all counties are green right now, but that designation is predicated on use of things like face coverings in schools. It assumes that students and teachers will be wearing face coverings. It assumes proper social distancing. It assumes all of the other safety guidance that the Department of Education has put out are being effectuated at the school district level. The face coverings, far from being any sort of impediment to in-classroom education, should really be viewed of as the vehicle that allows us to get to green and hopefully stay at green. The other piece to think about when we think about these color designations, take green, for example. The green here is not like the green light at a drag strip. It does not mean you push your feet on the accelerator and go as fast as possible. The green light here is really more like the green light at like a car wash, right? You enter slowly, you look around you with caution, and you be prepared to stop at any time. That's really the way in which these designations are offered. They're cautionary so that school administrators have all the information from an epidemiological perspective as they're making their decisions on the ground. Uh, I'm gonna turn now to Rachel Ohm at the Press Herald. Hi, good afternoon. Um, I have a question about what happens if a case is reported at a school. Uh, would that change the designation for that school district or, or what protocol should they follow and does that change things for the county? And uh, secondly, I was wondering if it would be possible to get a complete list of the, the metrics that you guys are using to make the designations. Sure, I'll, Rachel, I'll, I'll take the, I'll start the first question and then we'll open it up on the second as well. So uh, all summer long, Maine CDC, DHHS, and the Department of Education have been working on just the scenario that you outlined. We've done so with the benefit, uh, with, with that is to say the potential for a COVID positive case, either in a teacher or a student or staff member in a school. We've done so with the benefit of experiences from other countries where schools have remained open or stayed open or, or opened earlier than the schools here in the United States. Uh, we've come up with a system that is akin to how we investigate cases or outbreaks in other set settings, namely healthcare settings. Uh, we've appointed a, a point person at the Department of Education, and we'll soon have a point person at Maine CDC who will be in contact with one another so that DOE can have tabs on what's going on from the public health perspective and vice versa. We'll approach these situations as we always do with the goal of public health in mind. Now, how those might affect designations really depends on what we see in any type of situation. So we really can't speculate about how, say, a single case in Piscataquis County might change the entire county's designation. It will really depend on what kind of facts we're seeing on the ground. And on your question on which measures we use, we are using a range of measures. We don't have one single metric for COVID-19 that will tell us exactly what's going on in a locality. We think it's important to look at the whole range that includes but is not limited to recent data on case trends, positivity rates, and syndromic data, that is that data on symptoms of flu or COVID-19, but we also look at qualitative information. We know where there are outbreaks. We know the nature of those outbreaks. We can really dig in and try to have a discussion about what do we know is going on in each of these county, and that holistic, qualitative, and quantitative information will go into this recommendation which again, we're gonna update every two weeks. Things change. So while today, July 31st, counties in Maine are green, that may not be true in two weeks from now or four weeks from now. So we will continually monitor and update and on this two week cycle, um, revisit to make sure that the county county recommendations that we made are the same. Is it is it possible to get the full list of at least the quantitative metrics? I mean, I named three of them. We look at all sorts of data. I think that we are posting on our website the data that we use. So the main CDC website um, has that information on it. We look at that again, as well as the outbreaks that Dr. Shaw typically 
announces in his press conferences. And, and Rachel, the, the data that Commissioner Wambury just noted, um, are, as she noted, are on our website and they are broken out by county. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm gonna turn now to Patrick Whittle at the AP. Thank you very much. A um, couple of quick things. I'm curious if there are any parts of the state that are possibly greener or less green than others, like if any of these are sort of the equivalent of a swing state that could become yellow sooner than others. And um, also, I, uh, I hate to make you uh, repeat yourself, but I love the analogy about the car wash. I just want to make sure I have the syntax right, and I, I would love it if you could repeat that for me. Sure, sure thing, Patrick. Um, uh, so <laughs> I'll, I'll start there. Um, so, you know, what the, as, 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 we, as we think about these color designations, uh, I think it's important to note that the green lights here, the green designation here is not like the green lights you would find at a drag strip, where green signifies pressing the accelerator as hard as possible and going as fast as possible. Uh, the green designation here is much more akin to the green light that you might see at a car wash, where green means enter slowly, looking both ways with caution, being prepared to stop at any moment. And, and then that's how the color designations are offered. Sorry, Commissioner, go ahead. And I'll take the green, greener question. Uh, <laughs> and we'll say that we think about these colors really uniquely for the Department of Education, because what we're trying to do is help Commissioner Macon, as well as all the superintendents and people in their communities make informed decisions. So green is going to be a swath of, you know, certain situations where, again, this is all about the number of children and people, teachers, faculty, et cetera, in schools. So in green areas, we think that the risk of transmission in the community is relatively low, low not zero. We don't yet have a treatment or cure, but relatively low. That then goes to yellow where we get worried. There might be something going on. So we wanna give those decision makers some flags that um, they may think differently about hybrid learning. And red is that designation if we really feel as though there's a serious risk like we experienced in the spring of COVID-19 spreading dramatically or rapidly, that's when we go to red. And these colors are really just uniquely for schools. They're not for restaurants. They're not for other different sectors we really are tailoring them to our colleagues in the educational community for precisely this purpose. Thanks, Patrick. I'm gonna to turn to Joe at WMTW next. All right, we'll come back to Joe in a minute while we turn to Dustin at New England Cable News. Hi, Dr. Shah. I have two questions. Uh, the first is, how does Maine's plan stand out? Is it unique in any way compared to what we know about other states, perhaps those in the region? Secondly, what's the burden on our school nurses? And are each nurse's office throughout the state prepared equally for any situation that might arise out of an outbreak or something like that? I could speak to how our, our state's framework measures up as compared with other states. We have um, been collecting all of them as they are published. We've had feedback that ours is a bit more concise. It's a little bit more specific in some ways, and it does take into consideration not only the health and safety factors, which are populated in the first section, but also social emotional considerations and academic considerations and logistical strategies that, um, that may be used in order to implement all of those things. And so we, we believe that our, our, our framework is very good. I think it might also be unique in that it was uh, created by multiple stakeholders. We had a very large group who vetted and contributed and provided feedback into the framework that we have. And I forgot your second question. Dustin, as for the school nurses? Right, right. Are school nurses equally across the state prepared for what might happen? I can, I can tell you that our state Department of Education health specialist and school nursing specialist has uh, certainly equitably and equally reached out and has been working with the nurses and health professionals in all schools. 
we know that they will all be receiving the level of PPE that's going to be necessary. I wish that I could say that all schools in our state were equally or equitably resourced, but unfortunately, uh, due to local control, which is codified in our actual main constitution, the several municipalities make suitable provision, is what it says, for the education of the children. And not all states are like that. Many states have um, much more responsibility for providing equitable services at the state level. And so that said, we, um, we are reaching out. We wanna make sure that school nurses who are feeling under-resourced, and I, I believe they all do have a very good connection with Emily Poland, and she's our nursing specialist. If anybody's feeling under-resourced or nervous, they absolutely should be reaching out to us because we do have many supports to offer and resources. Great, thanks, Dustin. Uh, I'm gonna turn to Taylor at WGME next. Yes, thank you so much for taking the question. So I was curious about a student that might not feel comfortable going back into the school setting. How exactly is that gonna be addressed uh, at the school level? Would they be able to attend virtually even if the majority of their classes or, or other fellow students are in person? Well, so there are, there are several, there may be many reasons why a student or an educator or school staff person would um, feel uncomfortable. And then there are other reasons that would make it actually not advisable medically for somebody to be out in public in a public setting. So, so there are two different levels. If it is a matter of not particularly a health concern, but rather in an anxiety or a fear about um, returning, we are hoping that schools understand and that families and parents and students all understand that we won't be, we'll be saying at least at the state level that it is not advisable to return to in-person instruction until it's safe to do so. And we wouldn't be setting up a situation or expecting people to send their children um, into a setting that we wouldn't send our own children into or husbands, for example, in my case, who is a teacher in a middle school. Um, so we are, we are working very hard to make sure that, that uh, everybody will feel safe enough to be at school. And I'm gonna turn back to Joe at WMTW real quick. Yes, thank you, Dr. Shah, so good to get your report. Uh, just a quick question about the uh, two-week updates um, for uh, the statuses, and I wanted to know, there was a more significant outbreak in a school or even a collection of schools, how quickly the color system uh, would be updated, whether it can be changed uh, from day to day or whether the change would not take effect until that two week period. And just in general, how the superintendents uh, will be getting this correspondence and how often they'll be updated uh, about the, uh, the general numbers and where things stand. Uh, Joe, I, I think your I heard your question to be um, could would it be conceivable to update the color designations more frequently if conditions on the ground change? Uh, and what else? And, and and then how would we communicate with superintendents and school leaders? As to the latter, Joe, if there were say an outbreak at a school, uh, the the school leadership in that area would most certainly be involved. The principals, the superintendents. The entire school leadership would be involved at a minimum they would be briefed on what was going on uh, so that they may opt to make changes on their own uh, based on the the public health assessment that we might provide to them so we we think that that is the most efficient way to ensure that children are well and, and teachers and staff are protected at the ground level it's less about changing the entire designation for the county and more about zeroing in on where there might be an issue and briefing all the stakeholders in that area uh, to make sure they've got all the data so that they can make decisions in the moment. You know, you asked about changing the designations more frequently. Uh, depending on how things were changing statewide, it's conceivable that we might change the cadence of those updates, but there's also a need to make sure we're providing for stability uh, and continuity throughout the educational system so changing things on a day-to-day -day basis could introduce more of a whipsaw instability 
into education than would probably be warranted. So we're trying to balance those two things as we go through analyzing the data. Haven't made any final determinations, but we want to be flexible, um, but that's how we're thinking about it right now. Commissioner, either? Yeah, Commissioner? I'll just add two points. One is that there's also a challenge in a state like Maine that's relatively small. So you really, to see a trend, it may be that small numbers change and it looks like you're doubling a rate when it's actually a very small change in number terms. So two weeks gives us a chance to see if what we're seeing is really a trend in one direction or the other. And the second thing on communication, I would like you know, Commissioner Macon to talk about this as well because she does communicate with her, her colleagues all the time. We are purposefully putting all of this information on the Department of Education website. So Maine CDC, Maine Department of Health and Human Services, we are assisting Department of Education in this effort. They'll be communicating all this information to their colleagues. Great. Well, uh, Commissioner uh, Macon, Joe's question was the last question for the afternoon. So I'll turn things back over to you if you've got any closing comments for the afternoon. Um, no, I just want to say um, how wonderful is it that we are a state with all counties showing a green rating, and I think that it has everything to do with the wonderful decisions you all have made at CDC, at DHHS, our governor's office, and again, to the, um, the commitment of the main people who take very good care of one another. So thank you for all you've done. Great. Thank you, Commissioner Macon. Dr. Thibodeau, thanks for your assistance this afternoon. I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in. I uh, hope everyone has a great afternoon and a great weekend. We'll all catch up again next week. Thank you.